awesome source. Um, so um, welcome everybody. Um, I'll just do a bit of a mihi, a bit of introduction on Inclusive Aotearoa Collective Tahono, um, and then I'll pass it on to you lovely folks here um, with us to do a bit of introduction um, about yourself, um, what you do. Um, yeah. Sorry, Aram, I don't have a stream yet. Sorry? I don't have a stream on Facebook yet. Oh, do you not? Um, no. I think it's, it is coming through because it's coming through uh, on my end. Yeah, it's live now, so um, we're good to go. Um, okay, so no mai whakatau mai kia tato katoa huri noa i te motu, ko tai mai i tēnei wā, ki te whakarongo ki ngā reo o tātou hei whakamana i ngā whakaro o te tāhonohono. Kia koutou katoa i muria mai i te kai a te rangatira me ke ko te kōrero kei te mihi. So um, a little bit of an introduction about um, who we are here at and what we're doing at Inclusive Aotearoa Collective Tāhono. Our vision is for Aotearoa New Zealand where everyone has a place to belong. Our ultimate goal is to create a national strategy for belonging and inclusion by setting up collaborative, collaborative networks for constellations that support people and organizations to build cross-sector partnerships and collective, uh, collective support. In 2020, we asked for people of Aotearoa what belonging means to them and what stops them from feeling like they belong or included. Through this research, we identified three main constellation areas, having the important conversation, which is uh, around based around addressing discrimination, um, racism, um, uh, through uh, different communities um, and diversity as well. Uh, te, te Toto Kei Roto, a treaty that resonates with us all, um, how our treaty um, that we currently have, um, how this shapes us and what we do, and also how to have conversations and how to enact um, this, this, um, this really important document. Um, and lastly, also um, engaging media as allies. Um, as we know, media is a huge component to um, our society. Um, however, what the representation or how it's being written um, can be a positive or negative often, um, so often. And I guess today, that's where we're here today to talk about that um, around the impacts of uh, uh, media, um, especially impact on media on uh, the different communities, um, such as the communities that you serve, um, but also um, the negative and positive impact, but also in alignment to not only is it um, Chinese week, uh, language week, but also mental health awareness week as well. Um, how some of these are so impactful um, and it on into our communities. Um, so yeah, I'd really love to just open it up to everybody today. So kira koutou, talo falava, bula vanaka, ni hao, um, to welcome these amazing guests today. Um, so today we have Samson uh, Samasoni, um, who is an awesome uh, Pacifica journalist, uh, freelance Pacifica journalist, um, who also writes for uh, p and uh, and recently wrote um, a few on, uh, uh, was it, um, which which platform was it on recently? Um, uh, stuff, it was on Stuff, stuff? on p yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, and we've got Eva Chen from the Wellbeing Char Charitable, Charitable Trust, um, Amitesh Singh from the New Zealand Fiji Families Wellbeing Trust, and we've got the wonderful Remy. Okay, Remy, you're going to have to help me with your last name. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's a mouthful. Waltoifu. <laughs> Waltoifu. Perfect. Okay. Yes. Did I get it, it right? Oh, yep. awesome. <laughs> so Remy is an awesome youth worker um, in youth space at um, Palmerston North. Um, so this week she's having, she's had lots of cordial with young people um, around this topic today. So I'll pass it on to um, uh, Samson to do a little bit of an introduction. Uh, kia ora koutou, tālo whanawa, mā lō ni, uh, ni hao. Uh, Samson Samasuni is my name. I'm a uh, 
uh, journalist, producer, um, uh, director, you know, videos and uh, TV content, and have a very keen interest in media and how particularly Pacifica communities are portrayed by the media. So very much looking forward to our discussion this afternoon. And um, we'll go to Eva next. Kia ora, ngai ho, ni hao. Um, my name is Eva Chen. I was uh, born and raised in Taiwan. Ngai ho is um, the Banza language, Taiwanese indigenous language as ni hao. Um, I'm starting to try to use our indigenous language as much as possible. Um, <clears throat> I am a mother of four children, uh, Te Reo Māori students. Uh, I co-found this Wellbeing Charitable Trust, and we start to work with Asian migrant communities that, around family violence prevention, uh, school bullying support, and racism support since 2014. Uh, currently, I am the panel member of Auckland Council's Ethnic People's Advisory Panel and also a member of Kapuya, which is Ministerial Advisory Group for Christchurch Attack. And um, that's, and I've got two teenagers at home. <laughs> so that's pretty, that's all about me. Thank you. And we'll move on to uh, Amitesh. Kia ora, bula, namaste guys. Uh, my name is Amitesh Singh. Uh, I'm the chair of New Zealand Fiji Families Wellbeing Trust. Uh, we're actually a trust that's in the growing stage right now. We're, um, uh, the reason we came about is that we're the people of Fiji helping the people of Fiji in New Zealand. There is no lines around uh, the Etho K Fijians or the Fiji Indians. It's about the group of Fiji, and the, uh, Fiji people in here. Um, so currently we are actually having a um, suicide prevention campaign, which is over for three months. Um, so it's actually reaching uh, reaching out to all, everyone in the community whilst we are helping the people of Fiji. Uh, this is actually a humanity thing that we are trying to do that it's, it affects everyone, everyone's mind. So we're reaching out, connecting with everyone in the community to address the stigma around mental health, around talking uh, about things, especially right now. Um, so we've got that campaign going and I'm really looking forward to sort of discussing these things because sometimes um, this, topic that we talk it's it's how we're portrayed and sometimes there's a disconnect of our youth and people don't want to believe uh, belong to these things so yeah thank you for the opportunity also uh yeah that's me um fantastic wonderful and um Remy would you like to do a bit of intro sure kia ora koto I'm really excited to and privileged really I feel um to have us sit here and, and listen and um, put it all about this really important um, topic. I've loved having chats uh, with young people about um, you know this topic and getting their point of view. I'm really just, I find as a youth worker a lot of the time, um, just a, a conduit. So um, keen to be that today and um, looking forward to the corridor. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And um, Anusha, um, would you like to do a bit of a intro about yourself? Um, kia ora everyone, my name is Anusha, I'm the Communications Coordinator for Inclusive Aotearoa Collective Tahono and me and Aram together have been putting this, this first webinar um, series together which we're really excited about. So um, I'll be taking your questions on Facebook so if you have any questions you can just pop them in the chat box down below um, and we'll, I'll bring them through to the guests. Wonderful. Thanks, Anusha. Um, so we'll get cracking, eh? Um, I've spoken to um, each of the individuals about this topic for quite a bit, and it's just been, it's been really amazing talking to all of you. Um, and so um, let's bring that out to, to, to the forefront as well, um, so we can share with everybody else. Um, I guess, you know, some of the introduction to this is, you know, how does media reporting and framing of media reporting have had impacts on your communities, um, especially around uh, well-being, uh, mental health as well. Um, and you know, through your experiences and your community experiences, um, what has been some of the negative uh, and positive impacts um, with such reportings? And you know, when we talk about reportings, what are some of the reportings that's actually coming through? Yeah. 
I'll um, let anyone take it away. Um, I can start if you like. <laughs> um, yeah, I, um, you know, had a really interesting chat uh, with young people today actually about um, about the impact. And it's interesting when we start to talk about representation in media, um, I found that the conversations always started with actually the impact rather than talking about is there representation of young people in media. So um, that kind of indicates maybe that there isn't a lot of uh, representation in mainstream media and what there is um, seems to be having a bit of a negative effect. Um, we talked about, uh, for example, um, that the perception that young people's experiences, you know, because of there's a lack of representation, um, you know, a lot of people might think that the experience is one way and it's not. Young people are battling with a lot at the moment, just as we all are, but um, there's not a lot of information flow, I think, about the challenges that young people are experiencing. Um, and that has a real world, world impact in terms of um, the opportunities that they're given, perhaps understanding the conversations they get to engage in, um, that sort of thing. Uh, on the flip side, social media has a really um, huge, uh, you know, that's a lot of people's worlds at that age. Um, and there's a lot of uh, good things happening in that space, um, led out and run by young people. So it's a bit of both. Um, so what I'm hearing is that with the young people, there's a response that because there's a deficit or a hole that they're filling it for themselves. And I guess it's a positive and negative, right? Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. the positive of that, you know, they're engaging within their own, that, you know, there is understanding. However, the information might not always be well informed, right? That's, that's the tricky side of things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, Eva, what did you have in, would you like to? Uh, yes. <clears throat> we had a little talk the other day, right? I think the media will, we could actually put it into two categories, that the mainstream media and the Chinese media. For me, um, the mainstream media, I'll have to say that they have been very unkind to migrant communities. You can see the, well, not only to the migrant community, it's probably to uh, Maori and Pacifica as well, that we, when we see the news, it's all about negative stories and it builds the wrong stereotype for the readers. Um, and then I don't really see when they really celebrate some success or positive stories from the, our communities, mostly is most most likely are the downside of our community. And in terms of the Chinese media, I was lucky that I used to work with Sky Kiwi, which is one of the largest Chinese media in New Zealand. Uh, it could be very depends on the reporter because of we don't have as sustainable and um, financial support as mainstream media. Sometimes the reporters are not as uh, qualified <laughs> as we hope to. Um, they could give they could give misleading information, whether or not it's on purpose. And so this is how I see our media in, in, um, in our community. And especially when COVID starts, we kind of have to trace around with all that um, misleading information. We need to correct them. We need to make sure that people are not turning against each other. That was quite exhausting though. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think we also talked about the, the impacts of both mainstream media Yeah, um, the mainstream media, they are, they don't really celebrate the, apart from celebrating our, 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 our big events, they don't really celebrate the personal success or positive change of stories, which is not in sometimes like um, for some reason, I. 
I just kind of being very selective for the info for the news that I'm reading now because it's very stressful time now and it, I we just don't really need that negative um, or um, narrowed minded media reports. And then or I also would like to talk about the recently we have a very huge um, conversation around the rainbow community that that is also something that's really um, struggling, really disturbing to our community is that the information there are not very fair. The points they brought up about um, the, the therapist to the, to, to the teenagers or, or um, the transgender, that kind of conversation, I would, I would actually suggest the parents go to talk to their kids who has been attending the school instead of reading the media reports, because I found that our children actually knows better and more than what the media people says. Mm, thank you for that. Um, I Sorry, I dropped off a little bit. Apparently my internet's not having a great time today either. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I hear um, your what you had just said about um, being well informed, right? Both by mainstream media around you know migrants, um, not only migrants, you know Maori Pacifica, but you know even with COVID, um, you know the the reportings of COVID and the harm that has been uh, being reported that people would take upon themselves to um, verbally or even to the point of physical attack towards our migrant communities because of these misrepresentations. Um, but also within uh, not just mainstream media, but also Chinese media as well, uh, the fueling mechanisms of uninformed uh, uh, writings that, um, you know, like you were saying with the uh, conversion therapy bill at the moment. Um, how much of this is legitimate um, truth around uh, the reality or how much of it is driven by the bias um, that people already hold in these spaces. So thank you for that, um, Eva. And actually this really rolls on really well with um, the conversation you and I have had, uh, Mitesh, uh, around um, the necessity of not just having uh, reporting that is based on a few uh, a few festivals like Diwali or but the positivity of what's coming out of our communities. Um, so um, would you like to take take that away, Amitesh? Yeah. So uh, I guess our conversation has been around saying that um, the the minority group we're much more than just having a Langton festival, Diwali festival, or even a Pacific Up festival. There is actually a whole lot of everything apart from those special days that happens. So with any um, reporting, I mean, like with uh, Eva said, we've got the mainstream and we've got the Indian radios and we've got the uh, Pacific Fijian radio and channels and all that type of thing. There is a whole lot of information shared there. There's actually in those channels there, they discuss about the successes, the struggles and everything that we can relate to. If we look at the mainstream side of things, uh, even the some of the presenters are some people that we don't we can't even relate to as minorities, um, as like um, Remy said, youth. You know, if there there isn't enough representation on media for youth, so they can't represent that. Um, you know, so I guess with any reporting, you know, right now what we're going through COVID and uh, things of like that, it's it's pretty much the numbers. We we'll, we we'll look at the numbers, how many is there, and things of like that. But there isn't a celebration of successes. And, and with any reporting that there is, um, and especially with the Fiji, uh, Fiji side of things and the Indian side of things, it's anything that's reported, it is actually around something bad happening. But, you know, and that's the focus that's talk, uh, talked about, the bad, but what about the good things that happens in the community? And if it is a bad thing that's happened, we need to look at a, a follow-up afterward, afterwards to see what's actually happened from that not just discuss only the bad and then forget about it and move on. So I guess, you know, I'm just, like we talked about, um, we're not just bright lights, hot curries, bright clothes. There is so much in the community that happens, but it isn't, and what we bring together, how much 
the Indian community, the Fijian community, we contribute on our own towards the economy, towards each other, and we and it's always kept and not discussed and and talked about with everyone else because it doesn't reach mainstream media. Um, what reaches the mainstream media is a crime um, or coups in Fiji or things of that, but really there isn't anything about how much our average mum and dad in New Zealand, the migrants, what they do, how much they come together, how much they support each other um, and hold hands and, and achieve to become a, a Kiwi in New Zealand. Yep. And um, I think those are really legitimate um, points. And um, I think Samson, you know, being the Jono of this of this of this group, um, what's your take on everything at the moment? Um, because you know, we've had many conversations around. You know, what is the what is what does reporting look like? Yeah. Yes, no, it's a fascinating topic and I really appreciate everyone's views on it. I guess I'm going to tr contradict my fellow panellists a little bit and let's say in terms of uh, Pacifica coverage, that's the one that I follow the most, I think there has been a, a reasonable degree of balance there in terms of the successes that are people having, particularly now during COVID, around vaccinations, what uh, public health um, providers and those sorts of things people are doing. So I, I think the, the media has certainly doing is doing a lot better than it has in the past, and I'm talking about decades ago, uh, in trying to provide a more balanced view. I think what's uh, really challenging though, and this might be me potentially being critical of some of my Pacifica community is that I don't think there's a good understanding of how the media works and the best way to work with media to get an outcome that's going to be viable for everyone involved and all the key stakeholders and the community more widely. And the example I'll draw on is the one about low Pacifica vaccination rates. We kept hearing about this all the, you know, for the last couple of months. Uh, this has been what people have been saying around uh, what's going on with Pacific people and the narrative that's been built up. Unfortunately, what that did was paint a picture of Pacific people not being proactive, not getting out there. It was a very negative image. The reality was, though, it was our own Pacific health providers and our experts who were promoting this, this, this narrative. In fact, it was never true. Our vaccination rates have never been low. What was happening was there was a misunderstanding about the fact that Pacifica have a lower um, age profile, so that half our Pacifica community are actually aged 24 and under. So we were never going to have high rates or high numbers at the older age groups that became eligible as the campaign rolled out. So where I think the media it was is at fault uh, is, if we're going to point the finger, is in not properly understanding that and not um, providing some sort of analysis and saying, well, hang on, if you look about, look at when people were eligible and and there are, um, and how many Pacific people could have come through, we're actually at about where we're supposed to be, you know, where it's an equitable approach to it. But what they were looking at was the sheer numbers, you know, the numerical figures, if you like, and that's what looked low. So I think there were two things going on, was our Pacifica professionals uh, trying to push this narrative that we weren't doing enough, that, that what the ministry was doing was not, not equitable. Uh, media generally just following that line and not doing their own analysis and a little bit more rigor to what they are reporting. And the ultimate impact on that was of that is this negative narrative around Pacifica people needing to be carried virtually to the vaccination centers because they're essentially too lazy to get out and do things when they were, you know. So, so I think it's a very complex um, set of things going on, some dynamics involved there. Uh, and, and it's something Thing that we as Pacifica community professionals, uh, the health sector and the media need to, I guess, be better at, at, uh, at helping to promote a more uh, accurate, balanced and um, I'm not going to say positive because not everything's always positive, but a more balanced and accurate portrayal of what's going on in our communities.
I just want to acknowledge Samson. Thank you for being the Juno in our in our in this today's panel. Um, and I really just want to acknowledge, you know, um, what you also said around, you know, a lot of people, a lot of us, uh, a lot of people in the uh, communities um, don't know how media works, and that's the reality. Um, but I guess also what's what what would be helpful is like you you were saying, what is part of that bridging? gap between media and communities, but also what's the relationships that's necessary or required um, as well um, for some of those uh, uh, stories to be, uh, I guess, more or less more authentic and true and accurate um, that would be befitting to uh, the, the communities that has been written, written about. Um, and we can um, come to uh, we can come to that as well um, if you would like to discuss a bit more about that. Yeah. So, Aaron, I, I feel um, what Samson said and just around the key thing from what he, he said and I take is the, you know, the balanced and the accurate approach because, you know, and, and the fact is that not all, all information is positive. And from what, you know, Samson said, it's, it's for me, it was enlightening because and um, understanding that it is out there conception is that many Pacifica people are not doing it. But as he said that actually most of them didn't qualify when those limits were there. And, and, and to, because of that, that point has been discussed. It needs to be discussed openly in the mainstream media, not to be just generalized and saying many of our Pacific people haven't had it. The reason it hasn't had it is because they didn't qualify. It's not their lack of them not going. And that is the thing that I'm quite, um, agreeable with uh, Samson is that it needs to be balanced and accurate because it isn't, it's just a general comment. And then because of general comment and all the other <laughs> build up of background, everything of the Pacific community or other communities, people just add on. And that's not the right image that anyone should be under because it should be accurate and true and balanced like Samson said. Mm. So thank you, Samson. Mm. Thank you both. Um, and thank you, Amitesh, you know, um, for wrapping it up that that really well. Um, no, that was great. Um, because, you know, um, Samson did do uh, this really awesome piece um, recently just around the COVID response, um, just breaking it down, um, you know, where all, all of it was, you know, not just media, but, you know, government to such, such and such. And I guess, you know, when there isn't a balance, when there is just a just a story that doesn't have much context to it. And as many of our, our communities have experiences when there is no context, um, you know, what, what the media portrays and what the captures, the stories that's captured, how does that, um, how has that affected in your community? Has that increased the level of discrimination when um, such, such media um, comes through, um, yeah. So just with that word, sorry, I'm just putting my hand up. Um, you know, with that side of things, you know, with um, with the word discrimination and things of like that, um, I guess even in yesterday's media around the stats of 45 people, 45 people COVID, and then breaking it down and saying out of that 45, there were two families and two families of six people and there, and that's the that's what happens when you live with the bigger families. I mean, honestly speaking, I I know of families from back Fiji who've had 10, 15 people. Some people here, what's that? Mum, dad, and four children, or mum, dad, grandparents, and two children. So that's for me, it's a it's a normal family. But when it is said that way, two families, and you and then you think of South Auckland, and it comes down again, discrimination, and it feels like it's the Pacifica family family and that not that should not be in, in that case it should not be discussed or said that way it should be hey yeah we've got 45 people and that's about it rather than saying two of that is from six or six because it is generalized without inf accurate information could be anyone could be Indian family could be Asian family could be anyone but it is looked as the at the Pacifica family mm. so um I'm just, yeah, it's discrimination in a way, but mm. it's a, not a direct one, but it is assumption, assumptive uh, discrimination. discrimination. Mm. And um, reporting without context, right? Yes. It's the understanding of reporting without context, without 
uh, there may be statistic, uh, but there's no analysis behind the stats, you know, um, you know, like what Samson was saying, you know, the whole um, having a population that's so, so young, those are not being captured, you know, so there's no an, an, an analytical uh, uh, process of what this might look like. Um, so yes, and I acknowledge that. Thank you so, so much, Amitesh. Um, Eva, did you have any thoughts on this? Um, I think it really comes down to who is the journalist who writes the story. Um, I've come across some journalists who are really evidence-based. They wrote things based on the numbers they have or the research they had in hand. And I also come across some journalists that doesn't really try to uh, investigate the whole story, but just put, pop out the names and the people on the newspaper and then leave those vulnerable um, individuals to be cyber bullied. So it really comes down to who is writing that story. And, and I think it, it's something to do with the media that they really need to be cared about. Who are they? Um, hiring or training to do the work. At the end of the day, we want a transparent um, com community or media, but we don't want to turn anyone against each other. And look at the news lately. What are we trying to do? Are we trying to take? Are we trying to build a better place for our Tamaliki, or are we trying to turn each other against each other? For for the young people that. Um, against each other at school. What do we want to do? What do we want to achieve? And what's the most important thing for us for now? Thank you, Eva. Um, Remy, did you have any thoughts on? Yeah, I totally um, echo what's been said already and kind of following on from what Eva's just said, um, it begs the question, who are we writing for? You know, who's the audience and, and who are people writing uh, the stories that perhaps aren't researched properly or um, are written without that context. Um, who are we imagining that are reading these stories? And, um, you know, and both probably from the community and people who maybe haven't had um, involvement in that community before. And, uh, you know, what does that create? Um, I don't think we're being intentional with that on a whole. I know there are definitely some great journalists out there for sure. Cool. Thank you, Rumi. You just kind of um, disappeared off a little bit with your sound, but I think I, I caught what you, you just said. Um, um, but let's bring that back to Samson. You know, I think, you know, something that resonated is just the in intentional writing. Um, and for you as a writer as well, um, what's the audience, targeted audience that you are conveying your message across to? Mm, that's a, a really good point because the, I mean, the reality today is we have a very fragmented media. We've got so many more options than we've ever had in terms of where do we get our news from. And uh, if you like, there's a little bit of... Um, finding your the right tribe for the communications that you want to receive you, you find the right outlet that's going to fit your way of thinking so then if we look at it the, at the other um, on the other side how does whatever happens over here turn into discriminatory practices right at what point does that become so negative that it, it feeds into people's stereotypes or negative views uh, about a group of people and i think if we take the vaccination um thing as an example just get if i can just use that again i i, I think at fault here is partly the ministry of health right so what they they should be, as a public sector organisation, very concerned about how their information is being utilised. Uh, so that, because it, if it's not accurate, if it's not well presented or well understood, it can be misused, it can be misrepresented. Now, I'm not saying that their information is not accurate, but I 
don't think that it's been always presented and communicated in a way that's it's easy for people to understand and to digest. And then what happens, journalists are just as busy as everybody else, right? So and I totally agree with what Eva said. Some are very busy and don't have the background. Some have the background uh, and might have a bit more time to do their analysis. We can't decide who which journalists we're going to get to cover our stories. It's, it's going to be assigned uh, for whatever suits the outlet. But the Ministry of Health should be very concerned about how a reporter or journalist might utilise that information. So the more accurately they can present it to the media generally, the more accurate it's then going to be represented uh, to the various media outlets that uh, they want to carry that story. And it's not one individual media outlet or one reporter that then leads to a sort of discriminatory uh, approach on the other end. It's, it's the narrative that starts building. You know, it's the multiple multiplier effect. You have one radio station saying this, then a newspaper covers it, then um, it's on a talkback radio show. And it's that's what then leads to the narrative, which then leads to uh, uh, the, disc you know, the discriminatory thoughts that people might have about that uh, community. And of course, we have the unfortunate thing that uh, with the Assembly of God South Auckland event, that it was uh, an ethnic-based uh, church, and they were, you know, the, the main people involved in this uh, Delta outbreak. Uh, so unfortunately, the way that that was handled by MOH and then by media uh, then resulted in a whole lot of um, discrimination that, uh, that unfortunately the Samoan community and particularly those of the AOG church uh, suffered from because of it. So I guess I'm saying again that it's, it's, quite, it's very complex, but we have to give some responsibility to uh, the government agency that's supposed to be caring for our health, not only our physical health, but our mental health as well. Thank you so much for that, Samson. Um, so if you, I'm just going to, there's some questions that's come through from the uh, Facebook Live. Um, one of the questions is what needs to change in order for mainstream media to represent our diverse communities better? Is it better trainings for journalists? Is it more diverse journalists? Or is it better connections with communities? Um, so I guess this question also can relate to not just mainstream, but also our ethnic media bases as well, where a lot of our communities are informed by uh, those uh, channels and avenues um, for uh, their uh, source of information. Um, but I'll pass it on to Eva, who's uh, raised her hand. Um, I'm sorry, I raised my hand because I want to echo what Samson says, not, not really to the question. Uh, it really comes down to what the government organization responds to the public. I remember last year, back to the still back to the COVID um, situation, last year we have an outbreak that was a Chinese students and and the news went huge because our Oakland mayor publicly called out this person in the shop and that caused a lot of cyberbullying. And I'm saying that, yes, you guys do hold the information. You guys do have a key information, but then the government organization needs to be very careful what they say, because that should be their accountability that if it leads to any of the cyberbullying or any discrimination. And at one hand, they were saying that we don't want discrimination, we want to be fair, we want to be kind. And at the other hand, they are not very careful with whatever information they release. Same to the church incidents as well. That is so unfair to call out a particular church. They don't know that when they attend the event, they wouldn't, that was not intentionally, isn't it? If it's not intentionally, why have to do that why do they release the kind of information that really does more harm than 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 support the situation that's all i want to say and i think that's a really good point that um that has been raised and i think my next question would be if the government have come come with this where in terms of where media sits is do they perpetuate that or how do they not perpetuate that? 
so that it then doesn't become harmful because you're right um that example it was again a lot of repercussion back onto um, said ethnic communities that had to bear the brunt of the being persecuted, the vitriol, uh, the abuse um, that comes comes with it too. Um, yeah. Well, if I can just say a couple of things, I think the uh, recently the government uh, set up the uh, the Public Interest uh, Journalism Fund, um, and they put a lot of money into this. Uh, I think what's going to come out of that is a lot of training that will help uh, uh, Pacific um, and Maori and other ethnic groups, obviously, uh, be better covered in the media and because the journalists are going to be better trained if you like but it's not to say that media haven't been doing it uh, if you look at the award-winning work that stuff have been doing around uh tongue to issues and, the, and to treaty issues it, it's been brilliant what they've uh what they've been doing in that regard and and, and similarly other um uh, uh, other agencies uh, as well. And I, the problem is that as soon as they start looking at these things in more detail, then the, the naysayers on social media come out and say, oh, you're being too PC, you're getting all woke, and they start labelling them for all sorts of liberal lefty things, when in fact all they're trying to do is get a better understanding about a community of people that perhaps they haven't been very good at representing or, or, being, or reporting on in the past. So... Unfortunately, media gets caught in the middle of this whole discussion uh, when I think some of the work that they're doing is, is, is really creative and um, should be applauded. Uh, we've got the uh, another scheme that the NZME News Hub, Pacific Media Network and Māori TV involved in Te Rito, in Te Rito uh, journalism training program that's coming up. Now they're going to have um, I think more, you know, around 30 or 40 um, Māori Pacific journalists and others who are going to be trained up and in training them up, then those newsrooms are also going to have a better understanding of how to uh, deal with uh, uh, particularly um, ethnic um, communications and uh, reporting. So I think these things will be celebrated and there is a change coming. So and the training is getting a lot better and the government is to be applauded for putting more um, funding uh, in that uh, sphere because it can only improve it for everybody's sake, I think. So um, I just want to add a little bit around your question, Aaron, um, about all the, the first question on um, what changes and things like that. I, I feel like there is no one quick, one answer and no quick fix. It is a balance of everything. Um, and and the main thing right now is like Samson said, they've, they're, they're aware of it. There is some pro progress happening. There's people there. Uh, I do find that our own, uh, away from the mainstream uh, media outlets, our own uh, people uh, and media channels and everything, they do do a good work. And, uh, and again, appreciation to the mainstream journalists because there are some really good, uh, effective and impactful journalism, uh, journalism done. Um, I, as far as, um, again, it needs to be improvement. If we can generalize everything, everything needs to be objective. Everything, every um, information needs to be treated, put under the same light rather than a different light for different um, background groups of people and things like that. And also not only putting it there, but looking at the outcome, what would a person who's watching of a particular community or another community, how will they perceive that? And what could be the outcome and and you know overflow of all that that may affect the community that you know and that is if we put it that way it doesn't need to be soft but it needs to be accurate it needs to be true and equal for everyone not one rule, set of rules for one person and another set of rules for some other people it needs to be equal and I'm bringing back to Samson's fantastic two words balanced and accurate you know <laughs> you know and that is. For me, journalism needs to be honest, balanced, accurate, everyone in the same light, not no special treatments for anyone as different, but make sure that there's consequences because it's the people who are, once you've done that news feed or whatever, you've moved on, but it's the community who's there, the people who read it, it's about them, they get affected 
how it will overflow to them and their mental well-being and the social belonging. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to bring it down to Parmi. Um, Remy, did you have anything that the youths have indicated to you? Um, someone used a great quote today. I'm not sure if anyone's seen Beyonce's um, a couple of years ago, who said she um, put out um, a feature length uh, about, you know, creating her um, music festival. Oh my gosh, I've gone blank. You know that music festival in- uh... Coachella? Yes, Coachella. It's a great video. Anyway, she says in that video, um, you know, it's hard to be what you can't see. Um, and I think that's very poignant to this conversation as well, you know, looking at it from a different angle. Um, if you're not represented or you're not re only part of your experience is represented, um, you know, it's difficult to see how to get there or, you know, how to do something else other than, you know, uh, what people have um, surrounded you with in terms of what your experience might or should be, you know. I knew I could work Beyonce into this conversation somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rumi. Um, Eva, you still have your hand up, or yep. yes, yes. Um, cool. echoing was what Sam Samson said about NZ on air. Um, I've actually read through the, the list. There's no Chinese media on the list, so um, that's something that maybe us as the community need to work on that because we're probably not having the information as timely as for as we should um, but that's something that um, we're not as diverse as we hope we would be and in terms of the three questions being asked for the question one yes I do think that we need more diverse reporters in these diverse reporters they need to have a good relationship with grassroots communities so that's where they can get the accurate um, reports or stories out to the public to the communities to the second question about the campaign and advocacy is that as much as my understanding is that the human rights commission race relationship commission and main fund has pushed out a campaign as say no to racism or <clears throat> give nothing to racism that's something that is not particularly to any one ethnic groups it's actually for the whole Aotearoa new zealand we should, when we are writing or when we are reading the news, we should not um, have our uh, bias against any particular ethnic groups. And was the question three that I remember last year when we went to the uh, Royal Commission report, they, there's a lot of community leaders complaining about the media, about the hate speech, about the bias in our ministers. Um, I'm, I'm, I think as Minister Little and Minister Priyanka, they both say that they have no say to the media because of the freedom of speech, they can't really limit what the uh, media says. But I think now is the time we need to rethink that. Yes, we do have uh, freedom of speech. Yes, we do respect everyone's um, different perspective, but do we really need to belittle anyone or any groups to make ourselves feel better? And, and, and maybe we could, as a community group, that we could come up with some kind of petition and see what our governments will, will respond to that. Thank you so much, Eva. Uh, you've done my job for me, getting right through to the questions. <laughs> um, so the two, three questions that um, uh, Eva was referring to was just, again, from the public. Uh, question two was, are there any campaigns, advocacy groups that we can support to push for the changes we are in, uh, uh, we are after in terms of media reporting? So um, as Eva had just mentioned around the Human Race uh, Relations um, Commission with the uh, um, uh, no hate um, and no, uh, no hate um, and uh, no racism campaign that they've been doing. Um, as we've seen, um, uh, Taika Waititi has done a few videos on that campaign so far, um, but also question three around um, any potential to legal bills of rights act change to protect community wellbeing as well as individuals. Um, and I'll take it away. Um, Amitesh, did you want to comment on that? Um, 
Well, I mean, I guess I agree with what Eva said, you know, we need to, as a, as a community, come together and address certain things together um, and, and take it further. Um, and again, have those uh, changes in different standard of reporting and look at, because we are um, not sure how old the reporting um, rules and regulations are, because, you know, we are now 2021. There's many multicultural country people here we need to be making it more inclusive of everyone and addressing concerns and things about, like that, rather than uh, the standard of, there are, I'm sure there is standard of reporting that may, must be met, but it needs to be something that is more, more now, more current, more relatable as such, you know, and, and the only way we can do is have these conversations, have communities coming together and, and arranging and, and taking it up further with different channels and different resources and, um, government departments and things like that. Um, one thing I also want to address is that um, sometimes whilst we are looking at um, pointing out some issues and things like that, I always look at self-assessment and our own community and how we can also make changes also to address these things. Whilst we are saying that, you know, the journalisms are not there and we want to have more representation of our journalists, of our dissent and everything, but, but to be honest, if we look at um, the people from the Indian Asian community, um, most of them are actually going for commerce, going for engineering. Um, hardly many people are standing up and, and going for journalism. There is a few, I'm not saying there isn't, but there, these are things that we need to be also educating our communities to say, well, look, you know, this is also an ideal occupation. It's not something that it's not there, but there's many things to get the true conversation because um, like talking, just having Samson here, and I'll go back to him um, in that sense because he's got a wealth of knowledge around uh, reporting um, and things of like that. So again, you know, having that understanding is actually quite good and important that we have the reach uh, around. And that because right now we only go to our communities of doctors, pharmacists, uh, accountants, and all that type of thing, you know. Um, so we don't really think that journalism is a topic that our people, our com community people go to, or parents, we, as parents, don't say to our kids, oh, you need to go be a reporter, you know, or, you know, or it's, if we, we, I mean, my son's in commerce, you know, prime example, you know, I, you know, I, he's talking about doing English next year, and I'm like, oh, do commerce, you know, so if we want that side of things, we need to move from our own community and push that side of things, encourage our own community people also to reach out and report because and point out because rather than just or only blaming others we also make a change from within so um that's what i feel yeah yes if i could just pick up on, on that point uh, it was uh i remember when i uh, decided i was going to be a journalist um and I told my mother about this is many years ago. I won't say the exact years, but uh, when I told my mother about it, she uh, she said, "You want to be a what?" <laughs> because she she thought, you know, the usual doctor, lawyer, yeah. or church minister. Those were my three options. So journalist wasn't something that she had in mind. When eventually I uh, uh, was going into the public service, and I let her know that uh, I was going to stop um, being a you know a day journalist, if you like. Uh, she then asked me why I was really disappointed because what she found was because my name was appearing in the newspaper all the time uh, a lot of her friends were saying oh isn't he doing well oh he's in the public you know he's doing all this public media things so she actually was disappointed when I actually left day-to-day um, -day journalism but it's uh, certainly something that we do need more representation from a diverse group of uh, of people from back from different backgrounds uh, there's no question about that and I think there is a really concerted effort to do that by media and just on the point uh, on the campaigns obviously agree with the, uh, the campaigns that Eva's mentioned but I think the other thing is we also just need to complain. <laughs> we just, if we see something uh, that we don't like on in a, in a reporting, we should just write to the journalist or, or, or provide feedback and say, hey, I don't feel that was very good because of such and such. But equally, if you see something really positive, we should also provide feedback. We say, really love that story on such and such. So I, I now 
and doing this more myself because, you know, I sort of thought, hmm, I can't just keep uh, tis tisking from the background. <laughs> I should, you know, if I see something really well handled, well reported, I should give that feedback. If there's something that I don't think is quite at the mark, then, then we should also do that. And I don't think we, as uh, I'm going to say as Pacific uh, people, because I don't think I've seen many complaints go to places like the Media Council, and, and maybe it's their fault for not promoting the fact that a media council exists that we can complain to for some of the reporting uh, and some of the coverage that we don't like. And the Broadcasting Association, Standard Association is the other one, the BSA, that again, if we hear something on radio, TV that we don't like, uh, then we should be going to them. I would be very doubtful if there are many uh, Pacifica community going to either of those organizations each year, it'd be worth having a look at anyway. So I think we need to do a little bit more than that now unfortunately understanding the bill of rights it's a bit, bit above my pay grade um so i won't, I won't comment on that specifically thank you so much um samson um before we wrap up um i'll just pass it down to remy um what are your thoughts around this and our rangatahi um having having more of a presence but also having you know more of a a, a say too yeah mm. Um, well, I get really excited when young people's voices are um, put on a platform and heard and we engage in shared decision making. That's my jam. So um, anything that that pushes us towards that kind of activity, I love. Um, I think, uh, you know, and as others have said, there's no one solution to this. It's going to be a bit of a... Um, you know, a bit of a scatter and um, and also to acknowledge the things that are going really well. You know, there are some awesome, um, you know, we talked about Radio New Zealand, we talked about, um, you know, uh, the stuff, um, mahi that's being done around titoriti and um, that sort of thing. And so to acknowledge that and to kind of vote with your, you know, we used to say vote with your dollar, but I think now it's a little bit of, um, you know, vote with your screen time uh, sometimes. Eh? So, you know, to be aware of that and to make conscious choices about what we're consuming um, and encourage young people to do the same. Um, I think we can definitely encourage young people, you know, the conversation that Amitesh was saying around encouraging young people into different career paths um, and to value those career paths too. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes it's as simple as asking, you know, creating the connection and the relationship between the writer, the content producer, whatever, um, and the community. Sometimes it's just let's sit down and have a cup of tea and, you know, talk about it. I know we're all time poor, but I guess it's about prioritizing um, some of that relationship development stuff because it's at the center. Mm. Mm. Um, and thank you all so much for your time, your experience, um, the communities that you serve, and the wealth of knowledge that you come um, to this web, web series as well. Um, and I just really want to acknowledge on both sides around journalism but, and also communities, um, but also the middle ground of relationship building. Um, you know, like Samson said, you know, there's the feedback, but there's also the places where we need to voice our concerns. Um, to have that true, um, accurate um, reporting. Um, but, you know, Amitesh, you know, that's, you know, I, I love how you talked about yourself around your, um, you know, your relationship with your kids as well. Um, and a lot of our communities, it is hard. It is hard to push our kids to, uh, you know, uh, uh, careers like journalism, um, because for so much of our communities, it just seems like such an unstable, uh, sort of source of career and income and you know our fear of them not uh being able to carry that forward to you know as a sustainable way um means that we often don't encourage it enough or uh, we use it as a deterrent um but you know in this day and age as well it's like well hey you know we're we are we are empowering young people uh why should we put on the limitations and restrictions right we should be here to just support as adults in their lives so that they can flourish they can thrive um and eva um thank you so much for bringing some of these really amazing good points around not just around the con 
communities itself within the mainstream to also the engagements with our own migrant communities, but also within our own migrant communities, the work that needs to be done to bridge some of those gaps in terms of belonging and inclusivity. Um, so um, yes, I'm just going to wrap it up on, um, oh, what's the question? One more question. Uh, any advice, insight into dealing with media council um, as uh, someone had, uh, Samson had mentioned? Uh, look, I have to admit, I've never made a complaint to the Media Council, so I'm not sure exactly what the process is, but I'm sure it's very well detailed on their uh, the, their website. Uh, it was the old Press Council, um, so uh, they've got pretty robust and um, historic processes for dealing with it, and, and it's obviously well regarded. So yes, I would just check out their website and, and go through that. Other people may have more uh, better experience with that. But look, can I just uh, wrap up by saying too, thank you to Inclusive Aotearoa Collective for hosting these sessions. It's really useful to be able to discuss uh, our media issues uh, you know, on both sides, in the positives and the negatives, and be able to uh, understand how it can improve our well-being by um, having a media that does represent a diverse range of views and reports in an accurate and balanced way. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, thank you so much, Samson. Eva? Yes, I've actually done the complaint before. <laughs> um, one, one, of the, one of the Chinese media bring a very negative um, comments towards Maori and Pacifica last year and so I brought that to the complaint but on the website they asked that have you have you talked to the um, media and if you say no it will come and say you need to talk to the media and come back to us and then when we complain to the media there's nothing back from the media so that's mm -hmm. that's how it always left it maybe there's some procedures that they could change to make the complaint easier. Mm -hmm. Because I guess there's um, 22 days that we need to wait until if there's no feedback from the media, then we can do the proper complaint to the um, to, 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 to the media complaints. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And thank you for that, Eva. You know, you do raise a really good point around um, our ethnic media upholding um, values like tatility, upholding. Um, the values around uh, ethnic uh, racism and discrimination also um, and what does that look like in terms of the broadcasting standards as well um, so thank you so much for sharing your um, process um, and hopefully maybe there might be a more tangible process as well to um, keep our um, medias uh, more aware around the parameters that needs to have a fair and base and just reporting um, so thank you so much for that um, if anyone has any last um, desires um, and before I wrap up. Can I say something? Yes. <laughs> so I guess, you know, um, in, in here, I think, um, you know, with everything, there is, um, when there is a good reporting, we need to acknowledge it, appreciate it, and address it. When there is bad, we need to do that too. But one thing also, everything starts from within. Um, it's generally it's assumption and it's, it's the community who are on on the ground we talk about it we without us we sometimes we don't actually and whilst talking about all of this i sort of looked at it as that us as individuals are reporters also because every conversation we have every text we do every time we talk reach out to family it's how we act how we talk the conversation we have if we are actually sharing and connecting and and not not coming from a point of assumption but understanding of each and everyone's situation especially in how we're living then it actually makes changes from within from small if it is things there sometimes you know we don't know the education they are not there to how we can complain sometimes we don't we feel that it's not our place but again it's about connecting to everyone and and taking a responsibility about on ourselves to understand that we are actually little, little, little journalisms ourselves, and journalists ourselves, and we really need to. When we connect, when we talk to people, when we text to people, when we carry and go out in the community, we're actually there to connect and understand, and that is how we can make the change from within. And then journalism will flow from there too, and and again call out the wrong people. But hey, thank you so much, Inclusive Aotearoa, 
um, and I really appreciate what you guys are doing. Thank you. Oh, thank you all. Um, so, um, Rumi, did you have anything to say before I, I wrap up? Um, just a big mihi and thank you. Um, this has been an awesome chat and um, I've written a few notes actually on, on some things I'm going to take back and have more chats about. So just wanted to oh, say thank you. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, and again, I just want to say thank you so much for taking your time um, out of today to have a session with us. Um, so today I'm just going to close with a karakia um, and um, and then uh, send you on your way. Um, so, kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa paunamu, te moana, hei huarahi mā tātou i te rangi nei, aroha, uh, aroha atu, uh, uh, aroha mai, tātou i a tātou katoa, huie taikie. May peace be widespread, may the sea be like greenstone, a pathway for us all in this day. Let us show respect for each other, for one another, bind us all together. Namahi. Thank you all for joining with us today. Thank you. Kia ora. Thank you for taking up.